grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this second Sunday after Epiphany uh, is the Gospel lesson, um, John chapter 2, the first Simeon, Simeon of Jesus. That's the word that's used. And this, the first sign that Jesus did uh, to manifest his glory and the disciples believed in him. We call them miracles, but it's more than a miracle, it's a sign. It's a sign, and my prayer is the sermon is a sign for you, and uh, the revisiting of the, uh, of the turning of water into wine. There was a party here yesterday. One of our sisters in Christ had a birthday, and she invited us to her birthday party. It was a good time, wasn't it? It was a good time. Don't you like parties? Right? They're not work. You play. You play, and you celebrate. You celebrate. So happy birthday to the birthday girl, and thank you for inviting us so we could celebrate and have a good time. And you suspend the work. You don't talk shop. Hmm? You don't talk about your problems. You celebrate. You celebrate. And uh, that's why Jesus has come to earth to help us celebrate. And I see the changing of water into wine. And it ain't just wine. It's kalos wainos. Wainos is Greek for wine, and kalos means beautiful or excellent wine. He wasn't a cheapskate. He made excellent wine. I see this sign, this miracle, as the sign for the excellent wine that we will enjoy in heaven. For the fact that Jesus, bring, that Jesus brings to us a life of celebration. You all look a little gloomy this morning. You came with your problems, didn't you? You came with your stresses. You came with your depression. I did too. I did too. Oh, another day, Eeyore, bah, humbug, it's going to be a very good, very bad day. That's the way I came. But Jesus came to change that. He came to bring us excellent wine, a metaphor for celebration, a life of celebration. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. I don't know where to start. I have a secular introduction and I have a textual introduction. Let's do the textual introduction. It says, and on the third day, and on the third day, Jesus went to Cana where he had been by third day of what? Well, it's John chapter 2. The first 18 verses of John is a prologue. It's kind of a theological discourse, abstract. In the beginning was the word, you know that, okay. So he goes at 18 verses of a prologue, and then he starts a narrative. He starts what we're, what to is a gospel, the account of the life of Jesus. So on the first day, on the first day, John the Baptist gives testimony to the priests and the Levites, the Baptists. On the second day, John the Baptist introduces Jesus at the banks of the Jordan River as the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. On the third day, Jesus calls his first three disciples. I believe it was Andrew, John, and Peter. On the fourth day, so this is like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Okay, something like that. Okay, on the fourth day, uh, which leads, bumps up right to our text, uh, Jesus calls two more disciples, Philip and Nathaniel. Okay, and then the text says, John chapter 2, and on the third day. So three days after that, which would be the end of the week. So it's a very full week for Jesus, for productive. On the third day, Jesus goes to a wedding. And a wedding is a happy event, usually. Usually a happy event. And so Jesus, Jesus goes there, and they, uh, like yesterday's birthday party. And they look forward to having a good time. Although there's a crisis, a mini crisis. Whenever we entertain, my biggest fear, ask my wife, is we'll run out of food. And to me, it's a fear because it's like, if there ain't no food, no one's happy. Especially me. Huh? So I have that. Well, sure enough, they didn't run out of food. They ran out of the beverage. They ran out of the beverage of wine. And you know the story. Who approaches Jesus about the problem? It's his mother, Mary. And Jesus kind of puts off his mother, and he says, he says, my hour has not yet come. That's an interesting phrase. You understand it means it's, I'm not ready to do anything. It's not time. He says that later on in his life when he says, my hour has come. And what hour is that? When he drank the cup of suffering in Gethsemane when he accepted his father's will to go to the cross. So there's a kind of a connection there between the fact that there's this crisis at the wedding, hmm, this hour hasn't come, 
And there's a connection when his hour does come. It has nothing to do with a wedding. It has to do with his mission in life to die for your sins and for mine. Anyway, the hour eventually comes. And Jesus instructs the servants, I don't have to give you all the details. And he wills the water into wine. I learned that. Other miracles, he goes, he goes, he puts his hands on the blind eyes. He lets the woman touch his cloak, right? He brings the children into his arms. This one is, he doesn't, he doesn't need anything. He just wills the water into wine. Kalos huinos, excellent wine. And it blows the minds of the people at the wedding. The only ones who know that Jesus changed the water into Kalas Huinos, excellent wine, were the servants who filled the jars, Jesus himself, and his disciples. We were discussing this this morning, and maybe Mary, Mother Mary, figured it out. But nobody else knew. Jesus will. By the way, there are three kinds of miracles. There are three, kind, three categories of miracles. Suspending uh, natural phenomenon, like walking on the water, I can't do that, but Jesus did. Okay, healing the sick. I can't do that. I can help you spiritually. If Debbie gets sick here, I'll go visit her at home or the night before surgery or in the hospital and hold her hand. She'll feel spiritually stronger, but I can't take away. I can't take away her illness. That happens under the, the hand of God's blessings for your, your surgeon. You know. And the third one is raising the dead. This first miracle is suspending natural phenomenon. Nathan kind of put his, his finger on it. When something amazing happened that you don't ordinarily see. You don't ordinarily see what happens at the wedding of Cana. And it's excellent wine. And it says in verse 11 at the end, it manifested his glory. It manifested his glory. And the disciples believed in him because they saw the glory of God. All right, here's the connection. Here's the connection. What else manifested Jesus' glory? What else happened at an hour predetermined? What did Jesus do in a timely matter that manifested his glory and brought you joy and victory and new hope? It was the cross. It was the cross. You see, Jesus comes to bring excellent wine, not just in your kitchen, not just at your birthday party, not just in your life where you have good times, but he brings you excellent wine at death. His death on the cross and his glorious resurrection gives you a, another reason to celebrate. This is not news, and I don't mean to give offense to anyone, but there are a lot of us, including me, who are getting closer and closer to our final day, right? I'm older than you think. And we all face that. It's called mortality. But, but Jesus gives us excellent wine in defeating death and in rising from the dead so that we have new life. And in Amos chapter 9, it talks about, it talks about the end of time. When Jesus comes back, it talks about like a wine and cheese party. Read it. Amos 9, 13 and 14. When I will bring my people home. New Testament was back to Jerusalem. Here in New Testament times, when he brings you home, when Jesus comes back, whether we're among the living or the dead, Jesus will come back. And he brings us home. It's like a party. It talks about ample wine. We will be drunk, if you will, with happiness because we will live forever in heaven. Why don't we live that way now? Why such long faces? Why am I worried about death and dying? Jesus took care of that. There's a prayer in the hymnal which, which is a, a collect for a blessed death, to die with a smile on your face, which is, which is the way it should be because you have an eternal party in which to participate. Excellent wine. Oh, I was going to tell you this. This is my other introduction. Introduction at the end of the sermon. 
Some people say that the biggest party in human history was in 850 BC by a Syrian king who had done so well on his military battles that he built a new capital. I think it's called Nimrud or something like that. And so he built this new capital city and he imported all kinds of residents, 16,000 residents, to the new city. And the day, uh, the, 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 coming of the, the completion of the job was, the job was completed. And the new residents were ready to move in this marvelous planned community where everything was uh, wonderful. Okay? And so we had a party. The party was 10 days long. That's quite a party. Okay? And in my little book here, I have it, but I'll just try, try to remember it. He served the finest beef, the finest fish, sheep. In those days, they ate rodents, blah. They did that. And um, a few vegetables, a few vegetables, and they feasted for 10 days. And then it came time for the beverage. Beer wasn't enough. Beer was around, but beer wasn't enough. He introduced wine. He introduced wine. He had the beer, but he also had the wine. And a lot of people hadn't tasted wine because in those days, maybe somewhat similar, they couldn't afford it. So they go, this new beverage. And they loved it. They didn't want beer anymore. They wanted the winos, the wine. Okay? And he had plenty of it. And they feasted for it. And the wine from that time on became a sign of sophistication, of culture of celebration, of expensiveness, and of good times. Nothing's changed with Jesus. He brings celebration and a positive outlook on death as well as life. I challenge you this morning, I challenge myself, to leave your e ness at home and to live risky, happy lives. And to not fear death because Jesus' resurrection has taken care of that. We stand to celebrate a marriage reception, a wedding reception. That's the best part of a wedding is, right? Only people who reason, the only reason people come to the ceremony is because of the reception afterwards. I know you guys. The only reason you come and you sit in the hour for a ceremony is because the party afterwards. That's okay. That's okay. There's a party afterwards and this life. So let's be risky with our joy. Don't focus on your problems so much. Don't focus on being 99. You're just that much closer to the marriage feast. Be outrageous with your lifestyle. Generous. Take it all. Right? How about forgiveness? Be outrageous with forgiveness. Somebody's offended you. They really have hurt you. They were so mean. But who cares? You have excellent wine. Forgive them. I know what you're thinking. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus into life everlasting.